All right. Thank you guys again for joining us today. We are happy to bring to you guys our presentation for emergency preparedness. As you guys may or may not know, September is Emergency Preparedness Month. So we are happy to have Michael Rojas with us, who is going to give you a little bit more about his journey, um, how he came to be with AmeriCorps, how he came to be with the Disaster Services Unit, give you a little bit of background about Disaster Services Unit and how they are connected with AmeriCorps. We will have questions for him toward the end of his presentation. So he will call for questions toward the end. So if you guys want to throw your questions in the chat, you're welcome to as he's going along through the presentation. And then we'll we'll answer his questions right at the end. And then we'll jump into our second part of our presentation today, who is with Don Sowers, who will give you a little bit more about how to participate with, um, with um, emergency preparedness, um, and different activities that are throughout Tennessee that you guys can um, that you guys can join up with, and just take into personal preparedness. So I'm going to kick it over to Michael. Uh, Michael, you have the floor. Awesome. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. At least for me. Uh, so as Candace had mentioned, uh, I am currently deployed in Maui in Hawaii uh, uh, in response for the wildfires, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but. I'm here representing AmeriCorps and with our AmeriCorps disaster response teams. So it's something that um, we typically do and get tasked by states uh, when they're in, in need of our services. And I'll uh, jump into that a little bit later. But first, I want to give you guys a little bit of background um, on myself and part of this too. Um, so I'm originally from New York City, so 9-11 definitely hits home for me. Um, I was living in Queens at the time, and my father had owned um, a uh, um, air conditioning and sheet metal business, um, and I'm first generation, so we started that up from the ground up, and we had folks all over the city, thankfully nowhere near the affected areas, um, but it was still something that I remember to this day. Uh, and was actually one of the catalysts, along with Katrina, um, of this uh, career change of mine. So I actually was a school teacher back in New York. I uh, taught Hold on one second, Michael, your microphone. Sure. Okay, go, go right ahead. Yeah, and something that was hands-on, and uh, I had the capacity to really be able to support folks who were affected the most, right? I wanted to be the responder and not the individual who is being evacuated. Um, and seeing those uh, two disasters on TV was something that I always held with me and I never thought that I would get the opportunity to support. So I actually ended up taking an AmeriCorps position. I quit my job, packed all my bags, and I had two goals in mind, and one of which was to get away, uh, get far away from New York City as possible. Uh, to go experience something new and to do something in disaster services. So I actually was very fortunate enough to see Habitat for Humanity's uh, mobile response team, and they were in a long term recovery phase from a community that was affected by a tornado. And from there, I had a couple other opportunities to continue on as a staff position. And I, I have this slide. I do it in every one of my presentations, not because all New Yorkers are inherently narcissists, but really to give people an idea of uh, the pathways of careers that AmeriCorps can really provide and having that um, kind of start up from the ground of going through not only from Habitat as a member to a county coordinator and then working now at the state commission with the disaster services unit in the capacity of disaster. So. Um, for the next slide, uh, disaster continues to be something that is prevalent uh, and really catastrophic across the country um, and even the world, as you guys can see. So just to put some context into our conversation today, um, these are all natural disasters. And in 2022, uh, we set a, a very unfortunate record for the most billion dollar disasters ever recorded um in our country's history and uh, you can see that they were pretty indiscriminate right and americorps and myself had the opportunity to deploy and respond not only to hurricane ian but the missouri flooding um 
over the last year and in Iowa, our in Iowa, in our state, we also had an EF4 tornado that devastated a local community. So uh, we are very busy over the last year and it was something that we were able to utilize uh, AmeriCorps power, as I like to say, um, to be able to support those communities. So uh, we respond in a variety of services, uh, whether that be administrative or direct service typically direct service so if you've ever seen folks wearing hazmat suits going into a house maybe it was an americorps member because that's something that we do um, after a flood after water damage we'll muck and gut homes and properties um, but we also have a variety of other things so we like to take a look at what our portfolio looks like if we have a conservation core if we have a um, if we have an organization that does a lot of uh, chainsaw work, we're able to task them and communicate with them to be um, responders in this sense and in a structured and safe environment, obviously. So um, part of that is just putting a little bit of context into disasters just in general. Next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit about uh, the DSU and how we operate within an environment. So typically we get passed um, or we get tasked to um, go into a state. So we never self deploy. That's our biggest thing. And that's the biggest communicate uh, communication that I can provide today, especially on a day of service. We're always invited into a place that has been affected. And we typically work with other partners like FEMA. Uh, and state agencies, um, usually the governor's office uh, here in Maui, we're working with county officials uh, and each county is essentially trying to find um, their way in their own island, uh, obviously because there's some geographical, uh, you know, there's not a highway that connects all eight islands, so there's a little bit of uh, geographic isolation. Um, but this is typically the command structure that we deploy under and uh, you can see the little arrow um, I'm typically tasked as the incident commander, so I've been very fortunate and very thankful to go from an AmeriCorps member to now the individual leading these responses and having AmeriCorps members uh, try to learn and try to get into these positions my, uh, themselves. So um, part of that education is going into how impactful disaster can be in terms of responding to them. I do talk about how they're once in a lifetime opportunities for our AmeriCorps members, and I truly believe that. But you can see there the DSU uh, is that conduit, right? So they operate as that connector and making sure that we're able to do the things that we're um, tasked to do and they work with FEMA and they work with other partners to uh, communicate any pertinent information. And then uh, our strike teams are typically made up of our uh, AmeriCorps members. So next slide, please. So here are just some pictures uh, of our Missouri response from the last year. So you can see me on the bottom right. Um, that was the incident commander for that one. And we started out, um, that was our first day. And then from that teaching, that education, and you could see our, our whiteboard was in uh, day one stage, as I like to call it, and then it gets uh, incredibly efficient. So <laughs> don't knock me on our first day whiteboard, please. But you can see how the bottom right picture translates into the left picture, right? So that education, that training, that those conversations go into happy, joyful AmeriCorps members that are able to put these survivors back on their feet or at least get them to a place where they can start thinking about what their new normal will look like. Next slide, please. Here are just some more photos um, over Missouri, just to give you guys an idea of kind of how we respond. A lot of times we are staying in a, a lodging that um, we try to find uh, that provides the opportunity for us to kind of mass congregate. We have everybody together. We share meals together. Um, it's an impactful and meaning, meaningful experience for our members, as you can see in the top left. Um, we have an individual getting ready to go uh, mucking up for the day and the bottom right. We kind of have family dinner at the end of the day and we talk about our experiences and share um, our highlights and our challenges, making sure that the next day we can go back and we can take those and continue to impact survivors in a meaningful way. This was Hurricane Ian, so just to give you guys uh, an idea, Missouri was about 30 AmeriCorps members, and then you can see me in the circle. 
uh, in the left picture there, that's about 130 AmeriCorps members. Uh, and when I say members, uh, it's a culmination of not only um, true AmeriCorps members, but also staff. Um, we have um, we have staff, we have liaisons, we have other individuals that are affiliated with organizations, right? Like SBP, um, the St. Bernard Project, and we have the opportunity to essentially uh, bring them all together. We establish one team and then we go and operate and try to work towards a goal as one team. So just to give you guys some perspective of how much we can actually um, go from, you know, responding to a localized event to responding to something as catastrophic as Hurricane Ian was to Florida. Um, so this is actually a property in New Jersey that we mucked and gutted. Uh, this homeowner actually had bought this home two weeks prior to Hurricane Ida hitting New Jersey. Uh, so home insurance hadn't kicked in. Um, he uh, built this basement as uh, a shrine to his children. Essentially, he had movie a movie theater for them, like a projector. He had collectibles like Star Wars, Marvel, you know, anything that you can think of that would bring his kids joy. Um, and unfortunately, because of the topographical nature of his backyard, if you were to look at the front of his house, you would know that nothing you wouldn't imagine anything happened. Um, but the back of his house and his basement uh, were completely uh, blown away. And that's about five to six inches of muck in that photo. And uh, just to have some perspective as well, they were displaced because they couldn't, the utility companies couldn't get through all this muck to try and turn on the utilities. And they wouldn't uh, because there was so much down there. So uh, we found them. Uh, and then we want to work, and that's typically what we do as AmeriCorps members. So we can go to uh, the after picture now. So this is after AmeriCorps and uh, a game that I like to play typically as I continue talking. If you want to guess in the chat, maybe how many days you think this took us. Um, I love to see uh, just outside perspectives of how long people think um, it takes us to muck and gut a property. So if you could drop some of those in the chat, I'd love to take a look. Um, but this was a, a team and uh, this was a Texas Conservation Corps team um, who encountered these individuals. And we actually had one day of the New Jersey State Police Troopers helping support us in volunteer management. So it really opens up, disaster really opens up that opportunity for our AmeriCorps members to also experience volunteer coordination and volunteer supervision and, and really working with other groups that they would not have ever had the capable or the possibility of working with uh, in other environments. So it's something that's truly unique. You guys are everybody. I'm seeing it. OK, so some of you guys are, um, you know, I would love to say two days. That would be uh, absolutely absolutely my goal. And typically it does take us about two to three days to muck and gut a typical property, but for this one, it was so substantial. Um, there was carpet, um, there was a bunch of other stuff, and I don't know if you've ever had to pick up a wet carpet, but it is unbelievably heavy. So uh, the entire basement was carpeted and I, try, I had to uh, take off like three by six inches of carpet and that was like, 25 pounds probably this took us about four and a half days five days um which is a long project for us but when you have about 100 americorps members right you can really divide and conquer the properties that you're trying to serve within that community um and this one is something that was uh truly special for us uh, and being able to help this so i'm happy to report that they were able to get back into their property afterwards and now they're living there and uh continuing on during that time so now uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of Disaster Services 101 and just talk about the uh, DSU. Um, so they maintain the agencies. Um, they are the agency's leader in disaster, right? So they talk amongst our federal partners and um, they are operating as uh, that conduit again at, at the federal level for AmeriCorps, the agency. So they increase the capacity of communities, as you can see there. 
um, they have conversations with every state and they have the opportunity to be able to provide information and some historical knowledge uh, that continues to build that um, disaster resilience. So obviously we never pray for something to happen to a community, but we want to prepare uh, and that's something that we do. So you can see there highlighted completely in bold. We're not a first responder agency. I would say we're like a 1.5 responder agency because we want to make sure that local communities go through their disaster preparedness plans uh, or emergency response plans rather. And uh, the areas that we go into are safe for us to go into, which is why we never self deploy and we wait for local communities to give us that OK, because they need to make sure that uh, there's no power lines on the street or, you know, the uh, DOT needs to clear roadways. Um, and we're actually written into Ameri um, AmeriCorps is written into uh, the National Disaster Response Framework. So they have an MOU with FEMA and a, a DRCA, if you will, Disaster Response Cooperative Agreement. And they have um, us written into those plans, which also gives us another avenue to respond uh, to states during times of disaster. So we typically get that call from them, um, which is something that's pretty nifty. Not everybody obviously knows about AmeriCorps, but the folks that uh, have the capacity to task us obviously do, and they know the value of our work as well. So just a little bit of an overview. Um, so ADAR are AmeriCorps disaster response teams, and they're comprised of AmeriCorps and state national programs, AmeriCorps and C, and state service commissions. So that circle is actually what is encompassing of all the organizations that are on the ground right now. So we have an AmeriCorps state national team. We have two C teams here, and myself uh, as a representative of the Iowa State Commission. So um, we also have AmeriCorps Padre on the ground, uh, and we have the capacity to be able to bring others in, but typically this is the makeup of our disaster resources. And just to give you guys an idea of how much we've responded over the last couple of years, um, and I say couple, uh, <laughs> like the last 40 years, um, it started out with the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, that was the first disaster that AmeriCorps responded to. We weren't necessarily sure what the need was. Obviously, that was a man-made event, um, and that was something that uh, we knew that there was a need. We didn't know exactly what the need was, but as AmeriCorps we responded, and we were able to help support with a variety of capacities, right? And as you can see here, it's been pretty extensive. These aren't all of the disasters that we responded to, um, but these are some of the higher ones that we've uh, been able to support. And specifically in 2023, you can see we already went to Guam uh, for Typhoon uh, Maywar and then the uh, Hawaii wildfires here. And last year we had a couple others, but also 2001, we had NCCC teams on the ground in New York for 9-11, and we had a variety of other AmeriCorps members that were tasked um, to go support. So Julie Strzok, part of the Volunteer Iowa Commission, uh, she was actually an NCCC member, and that was her first assignment, um, was supporting 9-11 relief efforts during that time. So she supported donations management and other volunteer aspects um, in the city. So just to give you guys an idea, um, but these are the overall functions of the disaster services unit. They coordinate disaster services strategies. We work as a country essentially, and I'm not off base by saying that every everybody has a seat at the table to be able to have a part in the conversation um, to try to make us better at being responders. Um, they have that response operational command and coordination experience, and they also put those things into effect. So. They, the DSU, are the ones who choose um, the leadership for each response. I'm a little bit biased because I usually call them first and I'm like, hey, did you see what happened in Tennessee? I want to go to Tennessee. And uh, it, it's up to them whether they send me or not, and they try to be mindful of disaster responder fatigue uh, and making sure that uh, everybody kind of has their um, their ducks in a row operationally as well. So for us, um, I would say that two to three responses, I would say about two responses is kind of like a good sweet spot. It might be pushing it a little bit, but three responses is kind of uh, that extreme end of the spectrum. 
because 30 days is typically the length that we deploy for, and it is uh, a high intense environment, obviously. So, and then in the off time, when the blue sky time says we like to call it technical assistance and training is something that they provide um, always. So uh, they will do it for really any level in any type of organization that's asking for it. They typically go through the state commissions first if it's within the state and they try to support it as necessary. So the disaster services unit is very busy as are we as an ADAR network. So here I am representing them today. And that's really everything that I uh, wanted to cover, I think, with the DSU and uh, part of my background. Um, this has been an incredible and winding road that I have appreciated every day. I tell our members uh, here and I tell our members on every response. I really cherish these moments because I you never know when you have the opportunity to respond to the next one, but in the moment, uh, we have the capacity to make truly an insurmountable impact on a community that's been affected. Um, and that's there's really nothing that's comparable, at least in our experience within our work and that uh, kind of comes into these fields that we're able to support. So um, I appreciate you guys having me on today. Um, the Disaster Services Unit is always able to support and AmeriCorps is always able to support as well. And if you um, want to learn more, here are some additional resources and we'll send this out in the link uh, in the PowerPoint or I think it's posted on the website now. Um, but we have uh, communications, we have conversations with anybody who's looking to be better responders and community preparedness. Um, so please feel I'll put my email in the chat. I work with local communities and larger organizations as well, and we have. Um, uh, we tried to find the time obviously like today. Uh, if I woke up at uh, well, I usually wake up at like 5 a.m. Hawaii time, but um, I wanted to make sure that we had this conversation today and I just appreciate the time and I appreciate the space, but I'll drop my email in the chat. If anybody ever wants to have a conversation outside of disaster services at uh, DSU um, and just talk about how to prepare your organization, please feel free to reach out. I do have one question in the chat for you, sure. Michael, from Mark. He wanted to know that the property in New Jersey put any mitigation measures to like prevent future incidents. What's the like once you guys go in and muck out the place, what are the what are the next steps for prevention measures after that you guys provide or what happens after that? Yeah, so that's a really good question, actually. Um, so part of our response uh, efforts is typically a lot of the properties that are damaged are in high risk areas that are plotted out um, for kind of one off properties like that. I know that that individual was able to work with the county uh, and also the state to um, uh, review his land and to make uh, recommendations and to also make um, differentiating uh, improvements based on that land. So something like that would never happen again. Um, he wasn't aware that there was a sewage drain like rail in the back and that's where all the water came in and blew out his foundation. So um, he was also a reporter and had, is a very good friend of the governor. So I um, am assuming that maybe something was happening. Uh, he was able to get something done, but um, after a disaster, typically um, FEMA and the other organizations that are operating within the county, uh, they try to make improvements like building up levees or topographically building up um, containment plans like with flooding. Um, obviously, hurricanes are a little bit difficult to prepare, but there's things that we can do structurally that can make it uh, make it a little bit better. But areas like New Orleans and Florida, um, you know, they're always going to have that, uh, that, I think, possibility and the percentage of having a hurricane end up um, going towards them. So the best that they can do is just try to um, have that community preparedness and try to have those plans in place. Thank you so much, Michael, for all the work that you have done, the current work that you're doing in Hawaii. I know that I speak for everybody when I send out the biggest thank you for what it is that you do. We are, 
we're just humble to you and all of your efforts. So thank you for coming in, giving, oh, anytime, I'll give it to you anytime. So thank you for coming and just giving us uh, that connection as we switch over to, to Don that gives us a little bit more concrete on how to get involved with where we are. This conversation is so important for days like today on just how to be better stewards of our community. So thank you, Michael. Thank you. You have a lot of virtual round of applause. So much appreciated <laughs> for your time. I know y'all it's 730 in Hawaii. So Michael got up early for us. So thank you so much for everything that you do, Michael. It's okay. We're we're up at like five anyway. So don't I just appreciate <laughs> I appreciate the time. Um, for anybody who is not affiliated with an organization, um, look to your local volunteer centers like RSVP programs in United Ways to try and get involved. Um, and your state BOAD always has on their website great information. So don't self deploy. Don't send used clothing. Two things I'll take. I'll take uh, from you guys. So <laughs> no, no right. used clothing. No used clothing. Never, Thank you so never, much, Michael. Please. <laughs>